ahead and get underway. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jason Palich. I have the privilege of serving as executive director of the 495 Metro West Partnership. On behalf of the partnership, I want to thank you for joining this morning's meeting of our transportation committee. In just a moment, I'm going to turn things over to our committee co-chairs, but first I'm going to go over some housekeeping items briefly. Uh, I am about to paste the agenda for our meeting into the chat, or rather I will do as soon as I uh, finish speaking. We have three presentations scheduled for this morning, which our committee co-chairs will introduce. All attendees are muted during today's session. Following each of the three presentations, we'll invite you to ask questions of our presenters as you wish. You can do so either using the raise hand function and we will call on you and allow you to ask your question aloud. Or if you prefer, you can type your question into the chat function of our Zoom meeting today. Our committee co-chairs will moderate the Q&A portion. Uh, if you type your questions into the chat, they'll select questions for the chat to read them aloud. We ask, of course, all attendees, please be, uh, obviously remain respectful and please keep any questions relatively brief. We've got a lot of uh, really interesting topic uh, area to fit into just one hour today. Of course, before the pandemic, uh, this meeting would be taking place in person. And traditionally, our transportation committee would open with our participants going around the room to introduce themselves. In keeping with that spirit, at this time, I invite all of our attendees to utilize the chat function to introduce yourself with your name, title, and organization so that folks can get a sense of who's with us this morning. Should you experience any technical problems during the session, our immediate guidance would be to log out and then log back in. Should you need further assistance, the Partnerships Manager of Policy and Planning, Jeremy Thompson, is available to assist you and can be reached via email at jeremy at 495partnership.org. You should have received a notice to this effect upon login, but I do want to notify you that this session this morning is being recorded and will be posted to the Partnerships website and YouTube pages for later broadcast and viewing. At this time, I'm going to turn things over to our transportation co-chairs, our private sector co-chair, Rob Nagy of VHB, and our public sector co-chair, Joe Nolan, who serves on the MWRTA Advisory Board. And we'll start by kicking it over to Rob. Take it away, Rob. Uh, thanks, folks, for, uh, for joining us today. Appreciate everybody coming. Um, our first presentation will be from one of our service area regional transit authorities, GATRA, uh, on two new demand response uh, services that they're offering. Gatra Go United and Gatra Go Connect, uh, which between them will serve Foxborough, Franklin, uh, Norfolk, Plainville, and Rentham. Uh, today we have Joanne LaFerrara, uh, Gatra's Director of Customer Relations, and Stacey Forte, who is Gatra's Director of Administration and Compliance, who will offer a better presentation on this new service. So take it away. Good morning, and thank you for having us. Um, I'm Joanne LaFerrara, Director of Customer Relations, and I'm here to talk about the two semi-new microtransit operations that we are providing in, uh, you left out one town, which is Mansfield, uh, which is our largest one. So Sorry about that. <laughs> that's okay. Um, in 2019, we started Get to Go Connect, which was a pilot program uh, that would run between Mansfield and Foxborough, pick up a little bit of the town of Plainville. Um, it was a pilot program because we got a good deal to use this software, Translope software. Uh, we piloted for a year starting in 2019, um, opened it up to all the public, all our services are accessible, wheelchair accessible vans, and it became pretty successful. We were able to secure some funding to run it from uh, Patriot Place, as well as uh, Plain Ridge Casino. And it runs basically from uh, six in the morning till eight at night, Mondays through Fridays and 12 noon to 8 p.m. on uh, weekends. And that was with the help from the craft group as well as Plain Ridge. It has been, um, it's a smaller microtransit, although we don't call it microtransit anymore. We call it flexible services. Um, so it's basically a smaller flexible service area-wise. We have a geofence, and if you live within the geofence, you can call it on an app or you can call it through dispatch. It's on demand, um, and it will come to your door, pick you up, and take you where you want to go. Uh, I just ran the numbers, actually, for last month, and we did 1,569 riders. Uh, the wait time was approximately 20 minutes, but that's because it's only two vehicles running that system right now. Um, and so basically 54 trips a day which is a pretty good seeing, um, you know, after COVID, it's pretty good seeing that it's coming back. Now, the one in um, Rentham, 
Foxborough, Franklin, Franklin and, and, Norfolk. And, and Norfolk was started because we suspended our fixed route service during COVID. We had a Franklin bus, a fixed route bus in Franklin and a Tritown connector that went from Norfolk to Patriot Place in Foxborough. We suspended those services during COVID and just opened up for essential transportation only our local dial ride so when we were bringing it back, our operator, National Express, came with us, came to us with an option to use, again, another software company called Spare to pilot the program for a year. So we started that in December of 2020. And basically, we're using two separate softwares to see which one is the best, would be the best option for Gatra. That is why we kind of cover the town of Foxborough with two different softwares. But um, the SPARE software has been extremely successful. It's opened up those four towns um, to the same, uh, on-demand, accessible transportation. They can call it or they can use the app. Uh, I just ran the numbers last, uh, last month. We did over 2,500 trips. The median wait time was um, 15 minutes. And 49% of the people use the app, which is extremely um, high for people using the app when it's just a brand new service that's just starting. We charge $2 a ride. Uh, you can go through those four towns. Uh, and what has been really helpful during COVID was because we had to do um, social distancing on the vehicles. So when people call in or when they use the app, you're able to social distance per vehicle. Uh, so we never had more than two people on at a time because of the, the mask situation and the six feet at that time that we ran it all during COVID. Um, again, it's caught on really well. Our seniors use it. Our kids, the Dean College kids use it constantly. Um, and I think for rural areas, this is just the way to go. Uh, it's been, I think it's been extremely successful. Right now, we're just trying to figure out which software program would be the best. Um, and if anyone has any questions on it, um, we'd be happy to answer them. Did I miss out anything, Stace? Uh, nope, we just want to say we did receive um, for the uh, Norton Mansfield, the Gatra Go um, Connect, we received uh, discretionary grant program money from um, the state of Massachusetts. So um, that was helpful in the launch. Um, we received two rounds, three rounds, I'm sorry, of that um, to get it off the ground. And that really was um, a huge help. And during COVID, um, that system was able to operate and, and still um, allow for transportation during that time because of the social distancing. So between those two, um, like Joanne said, with the, the money from the craft group, we were able to secure as well as the discretionary grant funding and some workforce development grant funding from CMAP, we were able to run those services. Great, thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, if anybody has any questions, uh, please uh, please put them into the chat box. We have one question from uh, Chris Ryan uh, at Harvard asking, uh, do we have any handouts on the system? Uh, is that something that we, Jason, could circulate if they do have something? Yes, Absolutely. we do. There it is. There's a we link do, in yeah. there. <laughs> right there. Just, Absolutely, just as, and I'll put it to Joanne and Stacy. If you want to send us over some marketing materials for the system, we will send those as follow-up materials to all of our attendees in this morning's meeting. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, we have we have the marketing materials, but we've also gone out to market the system. Um, we've gone to a lot of the council on aging, and we've sat down with people and showed them how to download the app on their phones and and how to use it. And I think doing that in person has been extremely successful. Um, especially for, once the COAs started to open, we would send out people to use it because they were nervous about using the app. And, how, and um, but other than that, like I said, 49% using the app is huge. That's, that's excellent. Thank you. And, and, and certainly I know to reach out to a population that sometimes struggles with technology access uh, probably right. does, goes a long way to expanding accessibility for the service. So thank you guys for that. You're welcome. Great. Any other questions from the audience? Um, panelists, you have an ability to ask a question live if you'd like to. <laughs> um, if anybody has a question on, on the oper operations there. Hearing none, I think that is fantastic. Thank you guys for, uh, for making this presentation. Um, I, I see a lot of similarities between this and the, the uh, 
Worcester Regional Transit Authority's right. uh, service that they're yeah. doing. And I think the numbers are relatively comparable, you know, certainly yeah. certainly out here. So, so great job. I do think that there's a, a, a niche market for this that may end up growing. So, Absolutely. It's not yeah. it's not for every town, but for the rural areas, it, it works. Agreed. And Rob, we have had another question land in the chat, uh, which I'll put to Joanne and Stacy. Uh, the question, do you find trends in those who do not use the app? So for your riders who are not accessing the service through the app, are they typically seniors or are there typical characteristics? Are there, are there trends in those folks who are not accessing it through the, the technology? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, we find um, it's definitely the senior population, um, especially for Gatrigo, um United. They are very used to calling dispatch. Uh, we have an amazing dispatcher there, um, Chris, and they really like to call and talk to him. <laughs> so um, I think that might be the, the push. Chris is too good. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Sounds like a nice, sounds like a nice service and, and good customer service as well. So thank you for that. Um, what, why don't we move on to the next presenter? I appreciate your time, guys. Um, our next presenter, and I should have said early, um, Joe Nolan, who's my co-chair with the uh, the partnership, uh, has been texting me all along here. He's unfortunately stuck in a little bit of traffic and will uh, be jumping on shortly. So uh, he is, he's looking forward to hearing some of this stuff. And transit is his forte, so I think he's going to be missing out a little bit. Thank you, Jason, for recording this, this session so that he can watch that uh, later. Uh, but for our next presentation, we're pleased to be joined by representatives of the Boston Regional uh, Metropolitan Planning Organization, or MPO, uh, regarding their long-range long transportation plan, or the LTRP uh, development process. Um, a new LRTP uh, will be adopted in the spring of 2023, and as is usually the case, we're seeking input uh, for it now this fall uh, so that that can be geared up uh, and, and teed up and ready to go. Uh, 25 of the 36 communities contained within the 495 Metro West Partnership service area uh, are serviced by the Boston MPO. Uh, so with that joining us today to present this important process, at least the process, the start of the kickoff process, and began who's the chief planner uh, at the Boston MPO and the Central Transportation uh, Planning Staff, or CTPS, and Michelle Scott, who's a transportation planner for both the Boston MPO and CTPS. So uh, Anne uh, and Michelle, we'll take it away. Thank you so much and good morning, everyone. I'm just gonna take a minute to share my screen. Um, All right, here we go. Uh, and thank you for that introduction. Uh, my name is Michelle Scott. I'm a planner for the Boston MPO, and I'm here with my colleague, Ann McGann, to tell you a bit about our upcoming long-range transportation plan. I'll be presenting this morning, but both Ann and I will be available to answer questions. Uh, so when I give presentations, there are a couple things that I like to make sure people come away with um, at the end, and I like to present those up front. Uh, so the main things for today that I'd like you all to uh, come away with. Um, the Boston Region Metropolitan Planning Organization's long-range plan establishes a vision and major investment priorities for multimodal transportation in the region. We'll talk a little bit more about what that means for you later in the presentation. Uh, right now, we're kicking off development of our plan that looks out to 2050, named Destination 2050. And we're hoping that you'll stay engaged throughout this process and help us to understand your transportation needs and ideas. So just to hit the high points of what we'll be talking about today, I'll do a little bit of a, a refresher on metropolitan planning organizations, talk a little bit about the functions of the long range plan, mention the schedule for developing Destination 2050, talk about the words work we're doing. Oh, I'm not in presentation mode, thanks, Sam. Um, let me try that again. Sorry about that. How's that working for folks? We've got it in the um, editing view, uh, Michelle, but we are able to see the content of the slides. Okay, could I ask a favor of you all? Could, um, I know I sent the presentation last night. Um, would I be able to ask someone to run my slides? I will go ahead and run your slides for you, Michelle, if you wanna stop your screen share. Right, thank you. I'm having a little bit of computer trouble this morning. So. No worries. So why don't you go ahead and stop that share and I'll pull those up for you. Sure. Um, 
um, just a second. Okay, hopefully that stopped. Um, okay. And are folks seeing some slides? Yep, all good. Excellent. So Michelle, take it away. And just Michelle, just tell me when you want me to advance to the next one. Sure. If you could skip ahead uh, two or three slides um, after this one. Uh, this one. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so first, as I mentioned, just a quick refresher on what an MPO is. Um, we're federally required entities that exist in major urban areas, over 50,000 people. And the role we have is to engage stakeholders in those regions, elected officials, representatives of transportation agencies, residents, businesses in a collaborative and transparent public process to make decisions on how to invest in transportation projects. So as an MPO, we have three major responsibilities. Uh, first is creating this long range transportation plan, which sets the region's vision for transportation investment. Uh, we then make um, investments to meet those visions through our short-term capital improvement program, known as the Transportation Improvement Program. And we also um, do research and studies and analysis to also carry out that vision through the Unified Planning Work Program. Next slide, please. And this map just shows the um, jurisdiction of the MPO. And you can see kind of the, the subregions that border 495, um, the Minuteman Advisory Group on Interlocal Coordination, Metro West Regional Collaborative, um, Southwest Advisory Planning Committee, uh, contains some of the communities that um, overlap this organization as well as in the Boston Region MPO. And you can see some of the major agencies that are represented on our board on the left-hand side. Um, one thing I will mention, we just um, are about to go through our elections process. So some of the representative agencies may change, but this gives you a general idea of who's sitting on the board and makes decisions about how to invest in transportation in the region. Next slide, please. Hang on just a moment. Yeah. There we go. Uh, so some features about the long range plan, as I mentioned, it sets the vision and goals for investing in the region's transportation system. It also prioritizes major projects and investment programs to meet that vision. You know, and some examples of major projects that are currently listed in our current plan destination 2040 um, include the um, uh, funded by MASTA, the um, I-94, uh, I-90, um, <laughs> 495. 495, thank you. Um, interchange, um, the uh, 126, 135 uh, crossing in Framingham, um, the bridge uh, at Route 27 and Route 9 in Natick to kind of give you a sense of scale in terms of the projects that the long range transportation plan includes. Um, and again, as I mentioned, the plan's vision shapes the year-to-year -year decisions that we make about uh, how to invest in studies and uh, smaller scale projects. And it shapes the criteria that's used to select those projects among the, the many options uh, that exist for the MPO to fund. Uh, we update the LRTP every four years. Um, as I mentioned, our current plan is titled Destination 2040, which was adopted in 2019. Next slide, please. So um, we're beginning work on our new plan, which is destination 2050. Um, the horizon year, as I mentioned, is 2050. This aligns with some major planning processes and initiatives um, that are happening in the region, and it'll shape the planning that will influence our future there. That includes the Metro Common Plan, which I believe is scheduled to be released major this fall, later this fall, as well as the um, Global Swarm Warming Solutions Act, uh, horizon year of 2050. So it's, this gives us an opportunity to align with some of those major planning processes. Next slide, please. So this schedule highlights the work that we're gonna be doing between now and the um, 
It's expected adoption year for destination 2050, which is roughly halfway through 2023. Um, over this period, uh, which looks back a little bit to 2019, uh, we're going to continue the work that we've been doing to implement Destination 2040 through projects, studies, and, and technical work we do at the MPO. Um, we will then, starting this year and looking ahead into 2022, uh, do work to assess the region's current and potential future transportation needs. And I'm going to be spending a little more time in this presentation talking about that. Um, in 2022, we'll do the bulk of our work to really refresh that um, vision and set of goals that influences the decision-making processes that the MPO board carries out. And we'll be prioritizing those major investments, both projects and investment programs that focus on uh, smaller scale projects. We'll be starting that work in 22 and carrying it through to 2023 with the hope of adopting the plan sometime uh, summer of 2023. Next slide, please. So the work that's really um, underway for us right now is identifying transportation needs. And we've been posing these two questions to people that are um, that we're working with in the region, different organizations, sub-regional groups. Um, and they're focused a little bit on today and a little bit on the future. Um, so we're figuring out what transportation challenges and opportunities do we have today and what challenges and opportunities might we face in the future. And the answers that we get to these two um, questions appear in um, both our long range transportation plan needs assessment, as well as um, through our exploratory scenario planning process. And before continuing, I'm just gonna take a moment to put some resources in the chat that I did not have an opportunity to do earlier. Um, they include a website to our long range transportation plan page on the um, MPO's website, um, a brochure that kind of covers some high level details about um, Destination 2040, which is the um, plan that's in effect right now. They include um, a link directly to our needs assessment as well. So you can see kind of how we combined that information about transportation needs that we started collecting in 2018. Um, to kind of give a regional portrait of some of those issues and concerns. And finally, I'm gonna include a um, quick FAQ page about the MPO in general, um, if you would like to look back at that and wanna get more familiar with the MPO as an organization and what it does. Okay. Now, we will uh, we will do a follow up email to our attendees this morning that will also include these links that we're putting in the chat. So thank you, Michelle. Sure, great. Um, next slide, please. So I'm going to talk a little bit about exploratory scenario planning first, and this is kind of a new newer initiative for the MPO's long range transportation plan development. Basically, what this does is it looks not at a single future, but a variety of um, alternate but still plausible futures that the region may find itself in um, when we reach 2050. And those alternate futures are based on factors like consumer preferences about housing, you know, the, the considerable force that will be climate change, um, the state of the economy and things like that. And so what we hope to do as an MPO is to identify ways to invest and develop policy that will help us thrive um, regardless of the future that we find, we find ourselves in. Uh, next slide, please. So to get this started, we, um, we conducted what we've been calling the Big Ideas Study. Uh, this is an initiative we really kicked off in March where we collected input from various stakeholders in the region and thought leaders from different sectors, housing, economic development, um, environmental justice, to get their opinions on the major forces that they think will drive the future and the strategies they think we should use uh, to respond to some of the forces and effects that we may face. Um, and so what we're looking to do is present the results of the feedback from those focus groups, which I think had overall 53 participants from 43 organizations. And we'll be talking about that at the MPO's November 4th meeting. Um, those meetings are held virtually at the MPO. 
And so we definitely welcome you to attend and we'll make information available on how you can do that if you're interested. Um, and we wanna thank folks from the 495 Metro West Partnership who participated in, in one of our focus groups and shared their feedback, which is really valuable to us. Um, so using the information that we got from these focus groups, we're gonna offer up some alternative scenario options for the MPO board to prioritize for us to analyze. And overall, like I said, the results of this process will be used when the MPO is deciding on what strategies it wants to pursue when it's setting a, um, a path to investment for 2050 through the LRTP. Next slide, please. So that was talking a little bit more about the future. The MPO's needs assessment focuses a little bit more on some of the challenges that we're facing right now. Um, we basically do an inventory of issues in the goal areas that are listed on the slide there, kind of capture what's going on in the region and how we should best respond to it. Um, these include things in the safety realm, um, bridge infrastructure, uh, transit system condition and how that needs to be improved, um, capacity management and mobility, which includes things ranging from congestion to destination access to uh, network connectivity, uh, clean air and sustainable communities, which includes greenhouse gas emissions um, and environmental impacts of transportation, uh, transportation equity, which is a, a major factor in all the work we do at the MPO in looking at the impacts transportation has had on uh, disadvantaged populations throughout the region and how we can improve those service, uh, services and the transportation that they can access um, to improve their quality of life. And of course, economic vitality, uh, which includes you know, freight movement and the health of the region's businesses. And so one thing I'd like to make available as well, as I mentioned, we're collecting feedback from stakeholders now about those things. And I've put together a jam board. Um, I know we don't have a lot of time for discussion today, but this provides a place where if you want to drop thoughts or ideas about issues that you're facing um, in your communities and share those with us um, while we're in the meeting today, that would be great. Um, and Michelle, your link is going to host and panelists. I'm gonna have Jeremy go ahead and, and awesome. send that out to all of our attendees. Excellent. Um, and if you could, Move to the next slide, I can explain some of the major questions that we're asking folks. So essentially, how have your community's transportation needs and priorities changed since the start of the pandemic? Um, and what transportation challenges and opportunities do you see on the horizon, both in the very near term and in the longer term as we're looking out to 2050? And we, as I mentioned, invite you to share some of your ideas uh, in the Jamboard or even during the Q&A if you'd like to do that. Next slide, please. So I wanna to touch on some of the more outlooking aspects of the long range plan, um, just to give you a sense of what will be coming uh, later in 22 and into 2023. Um, so as I mentioned, ultimately the plan sets a direction, um, not only the vision, but a direction for how the MPL will invest in transportation in the region. And there are two major ways um, that we think about how to allocate the dollars that we receive uh, from the federal government for those investments. So in one aspect, we think about transportation programs. These are basically set asides within the funding that we receive uh, for the long range plan that we wanna to dedicate to projects that are not specifically listed in the plan, but are of a type that we know we want to invest in. And so this slide shows some examples of the programs that we have in our current plan, Destination 2040. Um, they include things like complete streets investments, um, community connections, which is focused on uh, supporting first last mile to transit, um, intersection improvements, transit modernization, which includes both um, improving resiliency and improving the um, customer facing and accessibility aspects of transportation infrastructure, um, bicycle network and pedestrian connections, you know, building out um, major paths and systems for those modes in the region, and what we call major infrastructure, which talks a little bit about those larger scale projects I referenced at the beginning of the presentation. So what we'll be doing uh, during the development of Destination 2050 
is figuring out how we might want to modify what these programs look like, see if we want to add new elements um, to them or whole new programs um, for those set aside funding uh, that the NPO will establish when they're putting together the plan. Uh, next slide, please. So the other aspect of this is creating a universe of projects. So figuring out uh, what large scale projects we wanna make sure are identified in the LRTP um, as the MPO is making investments over the next 25 to 30 years. So to do that, we establish uh, what we call the universe of projects. Um, and so we'll be looking at um, what's already existing and um, listed in the LRTP and major projects that are included in our um, short-term capital plan, the Transportation Improvement Program. Uh, we'll be looking at active MassDOT projects um, that we expect to happen um, over the next decades that um, we should include. Um, we may identify new project ideas and a needs assessment, uh, depending on the feedback that we get from our stakeholders and the results that come out of our needs assessment analysis. Um, we also may find uh, projects uh, based on the study and um, concept development work we do through our Unified Planning Work Program. We also keep in touch with um, MassDOT and the MBTA about major projects that are coming through both their shorter term capital investment plan as well as longer term strategic planning initiatives uh, like the MBTA's recent uh, Focus 40 uh, investment plan development. So all of these things kind of are in the mix when the MPO is considering how to uh, make investments that will support the region through the LRTP. Next slide, please. So this slide basically outlines some of the major steps that we go through um, really when tightening up the MPO's plans for investment to the LRTP. We establish those investment programs. Um, we talk about the universe of projects and figure out what should be included in it. Um, we evaluate um, those projects using criteria that are based on uh, the vision and goals uh, that the MPO establishes through the planning process. We figure out this relative size of investment programs, how much money we would want to spend in each, um, which prioritizes ultimately different types of investments. Um, for example, when working on Destination 2040, uh, the MPO really wanted to prioritize smaller scale projects uh, that would benefit communities throughout the region um, and so directed more money through its investment programs uh, to things like complete streets and intersection improvements. Um, we get our information from MassDOT about the amount of discretionary money uh, we expect to receive from the federal government in early 2023. Um, and then we can use these ingredients to identify major projects and set aside of funding that will include in the recommended LRTP. Next slide, please. So I just wanna close uh, with some mention of how you can stay engaged in the MPO's um, LRTP development process. Um, first thing I wanna mention is that you can sign up for the MPO's um, mailing list to receive information about meeting notices and events, um, which I'll put in the chat now. Um, you can also follow us on social media, including on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Um, we also host um, recordings of our various meetings and events on our YouTube page. Um, so if you're not able to make an MPO meeting or event but want to check it out, we have a pretty extensive list of recordings there that you can check out. And there's also an opportunity uh, to provide comment on the MPO's website. And overall, we want to encourage you to share your needs, concerns, ideas, and project pro and program priorities uh, throughout this process. Next slide, please. And so um, we just have our contact information here. Um, both Anne and I are co-managing the development of the Long Range Transportation Plan. Um, so if you have questions at any time or want to share thoughts and ideas directly with us, um, this information is available here and can be made available in, in follow-up emails and newsletters um, for the group as well. Um, so I'm happy at this point to uh, take any questions and thank you for your time and attention.
Excellent. Thank you, Michelle, for the presentation. Uh, and I'm going to have, uh, we do have some links that went into the hosts and panelists, which we're going to have put into the, into the general discussion group. If folks do have questions for Michelle on the process, you are welcome to throw them into the chat or the Q&A. You could also raise your hand if you'd uh, like to ask it verbally, and we'll give folks a minute if they have any questions. Uh, but we will, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to be doing a follow-up email to all attendees this morning with some links. Uh, and uh, obviously, as we talked about, one of the links was that Michelle created a Jamboard uh, specific to our audience this morning for folks to offer ideas for our region uh, for consideration and plan development. So that link uh, will certainly be going into the chat as well. Excuse me, into the follow-up email as well. But if you have questions now, you're welcome to go ahead and ask them. Well, while we wait for uh, a question or two to come on in, I do have a question for Michelle and Ann. Um, how does the the legislation that's happening at the federal level impact the the long range transportation plan from a funding perspective? Are you guys anticipating that funding to sort of come in at a you know a certain pace, or is that going to be dictated to you from MassDOT and what they what they see from their side? That's a great question. And uh, before I answer it, I do want to plug um, uh, a recent presentation we had to the MPO's uh, transit working group from a uh, representative from the National Resources Defense Council who's monitoring of the various bills moving through Congress and um, had some really interesting insights to share about that general process. So I'll, I'll put that in a chat in a minute. We are trying to monitor uh, the levels of investment that may come to the MPO. Um, I think the specific amounts that we're likely to get will be given to us by MassDOT, um, but we are trying to encourage um, member communities in the MPO um, to be aware of and communicate some of their priorities to us um, so that when we get you know, that information, we are able to respond to it. And that includes um, being aware of projects that may be ready to move through later stages of the design process, excuse me, to take advantage of some of that funding. That'll probably have a, a more immediate impact um, on us than, than some of the longer term funding outlooks of the long range transportation plan. Although um, we will be kind of seeing how trends in the funding that we might receive will affect some of our projections of what we may receive um, out through 2050. And I, I wanna leave space for Anne, and I know we have a, our MPO Vice Chair uh, Eric Garasso with us this morning. Also, if either of you would like to share any feedback about that. And now I think you covered it, Michelle. Uh, Eric, did you want to chime in? Eric is actually uh, in the, I can promote Eric to um, panelist if he would like to offer thoughts. Um, Although he's not actually coming up on my list at the moment, so I, I do apologize for that. All right. Any uh, any questions from the panelists uh, while we have uh, while we have these folks here? Um, I know this process is always a fun one <laughs> for for Anne and, and Michelle and their staffs uh, as they sort of pull it all together and and try to sift through all the different requests and ideas and concepts. So. I certainly appreciate everything that you guys do on, on your side to, to sort of prioritize, may not necessarily at the end of the day be what everybody else's priority is, but, um, or what the uh, individual's priorities are, but I think it's, you guys do a great job sort of creating this. Um, question, I guess, maybe Fran and, and Michelle, but maybe not, um, is the Central Mass MPO, I assume they're doing the same thing uh, on a parallel track as, as you are? They are. Um, the MPOs uh, in the Commonwealth are all kind of on the roughly the same schedule for, for LR2P development, looking out to that um, deadline year of 2023. Um, and so you, you may be hearing from them in the coming months about what they're planning to do for, for their process. But we do kind of all leadership from the different MPOs does meet on a regular basis to kind of swap ideas and, and figure out how we're going to, you know, address common problems as we're moving through this plan development process. And I, I, I know Rich Ryden, I think I saw him on the on the attendees list. Hopefully he's listening in as well. Right. And and we all have we all have the same schedule. Um, and we do things like we have to report on greenhouse gas emissions, and that's done at the statewide level. So that is also done as part of of the adoption of the plan. So so it's it's every MPO doing their plans and then then we 
provide the analysis for that. Great. Well, hearing, hearing no other questions, um, Jason, Jeremy, you guys have anything you want to add or are we good to move on? I think Jeremy's got one. I know he does. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, just a quick question, quick question piggybacking off on Rob. Um, you know, I know that some of these cost estimates, especially uh, in the 20, 35, 40 range and the destination uh, 40 plan, um, just thinking about those cost estimates, I know that, you know, the, the, the MPO at the tip level has had sort of issues with um, uh, identifying cost overruns and making sure that the, the mass.web website is, is updated. How do you account for, um, you know, changes in those cost projections, especially for those long-term projects and, and how are they sort of announced as you move from subsequent uh, LRTP? Well, well, we are required to update it every four years. So, you know, we use the most available information at the time, the plan adoption. We do apply a 4% per year increase um, for those out in the later years, but you know sometimes that just doesn't cover it. So, you know, again in four years, that's why it's updated every four years so that we can go back, look at the most recent information, and then then apply that. We've also, you know, there's also, and I don't know, Michelle, if you want to talk a little bit about the, you know, the tip process as we're addressing that. Um, there's actually an open house today. Um, I don't know if, if we can put that information up on how the tip is. Um, dealing with, with the cost overruns. Uh, but for, for the plan, we use the most available information at that time, apply the 4% per year. And then for those later, those projects in the later years, we actually go back and, and relook at those costs. Thanks, Sam. I am putting um, that uh, open house link in the chat. Um, yeah, the MPO has recently been going through some processes to figure out how to better manage increasing costs on various transportation projects, um, how to monitor them and make policy decisions about how to respond um, when costs go up a lot. So I just put that link in the chat on um, that open house about a set of recommended policies is happening at noon today. If you're interested in checking that out, I believe that will probably also be recorded if you can't make that specific time. And we will be discussing it at upcoming MPO meetings. Um, but that's a process where we're trying to figure out how to manage those costs over time. And Anne did mention that um, inflation rate that we, we follow when we're revisiting project costs um, from plan to plan and from tip to tip. Um, that's something that's set by the federal government, although um, we do have a way uh, as an MPO to uh, use a different inflation rate as we feel that's appropriate. Um, so that's kind of one of the, the discussion items that's been in play as we're working through some of these cost policy issues. Um, and one thing else to mention is that when we revisit uh, the long range plan in particular, we really um, encourage uh, communities that are proponents of a particular transportation project uh, to come in and talk to board members about how their project is changing over time, um, if it's going up in cost, what are the things that are driving those cost increases, um, and maybe if they're representing something that will ultimately make for a better project, making sure that MPO members are aware of that. Hopefully that answered your question, Jeremy. I'm happy to provide more detail if you like. Definitely did. Thank you. And one final note before we transition over to our final uh, presenters and topic this morning, and I want to thank Ann and Michelle. Uh, for those of you who are subs subscribers to the 495 Metro West Partnerships email newsletter are uh, about twice per month information and resource updates. The information on the MPO session this afternoon uh, that will include the element of, of cost overruns that actually the details for that meeting were included uh, in your October 1st 495 Metro West Partnership newsletter. So that's just a shameless plug uh, for those of you who might not be getting our emails to visit 495 Partnership org and sign up. Uh, and so with that, I want to thank Ann and Michelle. Uh, and I think at this point, I'll turn it over to our co-chair, Joe Nolan, uh, to introduce uh, our, our third and final session of today's meeting. Thank you, Jason. And, and thank you to Michelle and Ann on that uh, excellent presentation uh, on the MPO. Um, our final presentation this morning is on a piece of legislation that the partnership may opt to ev evaluate for formal endorsement. The partnership is a participant in the Regional Transportation Authority Advocacy Coalition, or RTAAC, 
In the current legislative session, the RTAAC is advocating for the passage of their RTA Advancement Bill, legislation that aims to ensure adequate funding for the RTAs, dedicate a portion of TNC fees to the RTAs, and enhance support for the RTA capital projects, among other provisions. The partnership has long been a vocal supporter of our regional's five regional transit authorities, and I've been fortunate enough personally to chair one of those, the Metro West uh, Regional Transportation Authority for the last decade or so, so I'm also a big advocate. Uh, so this topic is significant and important to us. Here this morning to talk about the bill are Alexis Walls, who is the Assistant Campaign Director for Massachusetts Public Health Association, and Enrique Pippen, I'm sorry if I, I messed up your name, Enrique, I hope I did well, uh, and Transportation for Massachusetts Community Engagement Coordinator, who lead the RTAAC. So Alexis and Enrique, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Enrique, I'll go ahead and share screen. Awesome. Oops. We've got it. All right, wonderful. Awesome. Well, first of all, thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Um, my name is Enrique Pepin, as formally mentioned. And yes, you did pronounce my last name correctly. So thank you for that. Um, I am one of the co-chairs at the RTAC. RTAC is the Regional Transit Authority Advocates Coalition. And we actually launched RTAC back in 2018 in response to Governor Baker's administration proposed cuts to the, to the RTA budget. Um, our group compromises of about 80 members at the moment. And um, what we try to do is we advocate for about 55% of residents in Massachusetts that live in the RTA service areas. We also try to connect low income families, low older adults and people with disabilities disproportionately rely on RTA services and RTA are lifeline during the COVID-19 pandemic. That's what we've been trying to focus on for the past three years. Um, I think we could go on to the next slide, Alexis. Sweet, thank you. So now I'll look into what the RTA's budget looked like. Um, so if you see, RTAs heavily depend on funding from state funding. About 39% of it is the average for all RTAs. Um, if you look at the graph here on the right, see that PBTA, for example, depends on 51.9% from state funding. The BRTA depends on 39.4%, and the MWRTA depends on 32.8%. This is really an issue for us over at RTEC because state funding is what we are asking for. Um, Luckily, this fiscal year, fiscal year 2022, um, the budget will mirror what our coalition asks for um, and what we try to work with the legislation. Um, so about $90.5 million will be going into base operating funds and $3.5 million will be distributed based on a formula accounted for ridership, population, and geography. And luckily, there will be no more performance grants. One of the reasons why we are heavily asking for dependable funding is, as you can see, fiscal year 2013 to fiscal year 2018, it's been fluctuating up and down from 80 million to 82 million back down to $80.4 million. And this is not okay for RTAs because RTAs are consistently trying to improve their services and implementing improvements, but due to this lack of funding, either the state cuts or has insufficient funds for RTAs, which leads to RTAs being unable to sustain this service improvement. Can we go to the next slide? And Due to this inadequate state funding to the RTAs, what we see is a lot of RTAs not being able to provide late night services. Some of them are not even able to provide services on Sundays or weekends at all. The geographic boundaries of the 15 RTAs limit rider mobility, 
many rural communities are unserved or marginally served, and most of the RTA buses run on diesel fuel, which contributes to air pollution. So this was all a background to serve to you why we came up with the RTA Advancement Bill, and my partner Alexis is going to talk about what's the next steps on how we could fix these issues. Thanks, Enrique. Um, so yeah, Enrique talked a little bit about the challenges uh, and we wanna to talk to y'all about um, what we see as part of the solution. Um, we don't see this as um, a, a full solution in ensuring that um, we can advance our regional transit authorities, um, but we do think this is a piece of the puzzle. Um, and so before I talk about the bill, I just want to um, first note where it, where it came from. Um, so some of you may be aware that in uh, fiscal year, uh, 19, I believe, um, the Massachusetts state budget uh, called for the establishment of a task force on RTA performance and funding. Um, and that task force produced a report in 2019 that made 24 recommendations um, that address um, increasing <clears throat> regional transit access. Those recommendations uh, ran the gambit um, and had to do with, you know, what it looks like to invest in RTAs, um, what it looks like to um, hold RTAs accountable accountable and really um, increase coordination between MassDOT and RTAs, um, improving quality of service. So there was there was a, a ton of recommendations, um, but one that I just want to bring your attention to um, is, is a big conclusion for that report, which is um, that if we do want RTAs to innovate, um, to expand and to improve to meet community needs, um, RTAs need financial predictability and stability. Um, and based on what Enrique just shared, we know that has not necessarily always been the case. Um, and so our coalition um, decided to work together um, and to work with legislative champions, um, Rep Blay and Senator Chandler to file a bill that we think helps um, advance some key recommendations in that report. Um, and so I'm pulling up right now a slide that just sort of breaks down what we see as sort of the six key provisions for the bill. Um, but I also just wanna pop in the chat our bill fact sheet um, so that you all can follow along with us. So give me a moment to do that. And we will go ahead and include the bill fact sheet in our follow-up email for our attendees this morning. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, all right. So you all should be able to see that um, in the chat now, and I'm just going to sort of go through each provision. Um, so the first, as we mentioned, investment is really big, and so a few of these just have to do with um, investing in RTAs. Um, so we want to ensure adequate funding for RTAs um, in the annual state budget. As Enrique mentioned, um, about 40%, that's sort of like the average, um, the average uh, portion of operating funds for RTAs that come from the annual state budget. Um, and so we know that when operating assistance from the state is unpredictable, as it has been in the past, um, and when it doesn't increase along with the cost of operating, um, RTA planning and budget processes are negatively impacted, which in turn hurts the writer. Um, and so this bill would set a $94 million floor um, for state contract assistance for RTAs in fiscal year 22. Um, and it would also include an annual um, automatic increase based on inflation. Um, and I do just want to flag that um, as as Enrique mentioned, um, we are we have already been successful in advocating for $94 million um, total going towards base operating for RTAs in fiscal year 22, which is great. Um, and that's in large part due to um, the advocacy of members of the RTAC like um, 495 Metro West Partnership. So thank you all for that. Um, another thing this bill would do is it would dedicate a portion of Uber and Lyft fees to support RTAs. Um, so, you know, we talked about adequate uh, base funding for RTAs. But we know that RTAs also need a dedicated source of revenue. Um, the MBTA, in addition to their um, funding through the annual state budget, also gets uh, dedicated, uh, dedicated funding from the sales tax. And we think that RTAs um, should have this as well. Um, and so this bill would actually direct 50% of transportation network company fees um, in the Commonwealth Transportation Fund to RTAs. Um, I want to note that this bill would not increase Uber and Lyft fees. Um, there are other bills that have been filed this session that would do so if passed, um, but this bill would just ensure that the money that is already going into the Commonwealth Transportation Fund from TNC fees, that 50% of that would go towards the RTAs and 50% of that would go towards the MBTA. Um, so that we're really um, supporting transit um, and not just roads and bridges. Um, 
Another thing this bill would do is it would revitalize the RTA Council. Um, so currently each RTA is managed and operated through its own organizational processes, um, which you know we do not want to change, but we would like to see greater collaboration between RTAs, MassDOT, and riders of the RTAs. Um, and so currently the RTA Council is comprised of representatives from um, the RTAs, MassDOT, and the MBTA, and they share best practices, which is, which is really helpful. Um, but what this bill would do is it would um, provide a rider provide a seat for riders on the council, um, for a rider on the council. Um, and it would also um, support service improvement planning by requiring an annual report from the council um, to MassDOT on funding, technical assistance, and service needs of RTAs. This bill would also enhance capital support for RTA projects. Um, we know that if RTA fleets are going to um, be in good repair and we want to support new technologies, um, we recognize that RTAs need um, not just um, an increase in operating funds, but they also do sometimes need more um, support for capital projects. Um, and so what this bill would do is it would establish parity between RTAs and the MBTA um, where state capital funds are used as a match for federal funds. This bill would support electrification of RTA buses. Um, so we know that there have been RTAs that have made significant project progress on the electrification of fleets, um, but many um, RTA fleets still run on diesel fuel, um, which is highly polluting. Um, and so this bill would um, direct MassDOT to support RTAs in the development of comprehensive electric bus plans. And then lastly, this bill would um, require that mass stops stop grading um, RTAs on the fare box recovery ratio. Um, the fare box recovery ratio is a performance metric that is used um, that sort of measures how much of an RTA's operating budget is covered by um, fair, fair revenue and what they're collecting in fares, um, which is essentially um, uh, grading RTAs on how profitable they are. Um, and so this bill would um, end use of the fare box recovery ratio, um, which we believe is a performance metric that uh, deepens inequities um, by incentivizing fair policies that burden riders. So um, that is sort of what the bill does. Um, I am going to just sort of leave this slide on for a little bit um, so that you all can sort of read through some of the testimonies um, that the, some of our advocates have provided. We had a hearing for the bill July 22nd, um, where we were able to provide both oral testimony as a coalition, as well as written testimony. Um, and so these are just some um, snippets of what our, what our advocates have shared. Um, I'll read one out um, from a partner that works in uh, Franklin County in Greenfield. Um, she said that having the ability to incorporate Incorporate temporary pilot programs into the regular operation of the FRTA through increased dedicated funding would allow more people to enter or re-enter the workforce, um, attend secondary education, um, etc. Um, another advocate shared that um, most of us, and this is an advocate um, in the Worcester area, the WRTA area, who is a writer, um, he said that most of us cannot or do not drive. Our greatest fear is that one day our bus stop or route will disappear. We are victims of a misguided campaign mass dot calls greater efficiency. Um, and so I just wanted to share that. Um, you know, we'll, we'll provide slides. So if you all want time to look through some of these um, other quotes, you are free to do so. Um, so what can you all do? Uh, there are tons of things you all can actually do to help us advance this bill through the legislature. Um, but for right now, we know that as, a, as an organization, um, you all actually have to vote internally on whether or not you want to endorse this bill. Um, and so I think what we would leave you with um, is if you are interested in taking action as an individual, um, please feel free to reach out to myself or Enrique. Our emails are on the screen in front of you. Um, but we would also love um, 495 Metro West partnerships um, support um, for this bill. Um, and so uh, please vote to endorse the RTA advancement bill. Well, thank you, Alexis and Enrique. Um, I'm sure we have a, a moment for some discussion. I'll just say as an, one of the RTA chairs, um, I was pretty clear and, and you had a slide earlier that de uh, depicted the fact that from 2013 to 18 that the RTAs were level funded. And I'm sure, you know, as if you managed any organization, uh, expenses did, were not level funded. So uh, working hard with the Metro West delegation uh, and, uh, and the creation of the RTAAC, 
Um, you know, seeing those budgets from the state side at least come in at 88 and 90 million dollars in the last couple of years, respectively, and hearing that 2022 is going to be 94 million, that is, uh, you know, music to the ears. Um, the the RTAs provide that last mile, that connection. All the investment, you know, has gone into the the core, you know, the MBTA and systems like that and, and highways. The RTAs are are really important in neighborhoods, and I saw personally during COVID where everything dropped off so substantially. Well, at the MBTA, it's taking longer to come back because people are, have different work schedules and maybe not buying monthly passes. And if you've driven to Boston, you've seen there's a lot of traffic these days. Um, the RTAs are, uh, are, are uh, you know, coming back a little quicker because the people that need those services uh, really need them and they're using them. So we appreciate all the work you've been doing on that. And Joe, uh, if I could jump in with a quick question for Alexis and Enrique, uh, conscious of the clock and that we've, we've got to wrap in a second, absolutely. I'll put Alexis and Enrique in the spot. Obviously, the 495 Metro West Partnership has its internal process, but each of our, obviously our stakeholder uh, entities are obviously, you know, different groups, different individuals with, with their own uh, views and advocacy. For those folks who might be on the meeting or watching the meeting later who are interested in advocating on the bill, Alexis, I'm curious if you could just tell us quickly where it is in committee. Uh, if somebody wanted to advocate on this bill, where might that advocacy be best directed? Absolutely. That is a great question, Jason. Um, so I would say a couple of things. Um, so where this bill is in committee, um, is it's, it's stuck in committee. Um, <laughs> and so we really, really want um, leadership of the Joint uh, Committee on Transportation to vote um, to, to give this bill a favorable report out of committee so that it can move through the legislative process. Um, and so we as a coalition have just been thinking about ways to um, pressure, the, uh, pressure the Transportation Committee to do so. Um, um, one thing that you all can always do is to reach out to your legislator and tell them why you support this piece of legislation, why it's important to you. Um, as Joe said, RTAs are incredibly important. Enrique, you know, uh, cited that figure earlier in the presentation, 55% of Massachusetts residents live in an RTA service area. And many of those folks are either unserved or they're marginally served um, because we have not really invested in regional transit the way that we should in this state. And so um, please reach out to your, um, your legislators and ask them to co-sponsor the bill. Um, we as a coalition are certainly um, working on some strategies um, with our legislative champions. Um, and we'll have information on how folks can support those soon. Um, and so I would say you could also join our listserv. Um, we'll put our email addresses in the chat. And so you can just shoot us an email if you want to get um, sort of like big um, updates or action alerts. Um, we send those out to folks so you know when to take action, why it's important to take action, and who you should be um, reaching out to. Um, and we'll also typically provide uh, templates that support your advocacy and make it a little bit easy for you. So I would say the most important things right now um, are just uh, scheduling time with your legislator if you haven't already, um, seeing whether or not they already co-sponsored the bill. I can put in the chat um, links to uh, where you can find your legislators and then also where you can um, where you can find whether or not they've already co-sponsored the bill. Um, so yeah, please please do that outreach and join our listserv. Yeah, and then can I add one more thing? Yeah, oh, right absolutely. Go ahead, Alexa. I mean, just to keep just, just to keep in mind that um. Senator Boncori was the Senate leader of the Transportation Committee. So we are still waiting for someone to be elected so that then there could be a Senate leadership. And, and for those believe, who don't know, Senator Boncori recently left the Senate to head up MassBio. Yes, exactly. Thank you, Jason. So unfortunately, we are waiting um, for there to be leadership on the Senate side. So without this, this bill cannot continue to move forward. I and mean, we believe that a leader will be nominated in January of this upcoming year. So we would also try to keep everyone updated once there is someone nominated for the leadership position on the Senate side. Great. So yes, uh, go ahead, Joe. Oh, I, I was just gonna add quickly, Jason, because I know we're cognizant of time. Um, the partnership hasn't taken a position on this particular bill yet. Um, I, I ex expect we will in the near term. Um, our legislative delegation, meaning Metro West legislative delegation has been supportive of this type of legislation. I don't know where they are personally, but certainly we'll be, you know, with this kind of presentation, it, it, it brings it to the fore for all of us. And we will um, certainly do so in the near term. And, and we very much appreciate the work you guys are doing on this effort. I'll give it back to you, Jason. Thank you, Joe. And I'll close by noting one of the sponsors of this bill, Senator Harriet Chandler, 
uh, actually at present uh, is, is a member of the 495 Metro West delegation through the town of Northborough, a portion of which is in her district. Should Senator Chandler continue to serve into the next session and should the maps that came out earlier this week be adopted, Senator Chandler will pick up even more 495 Metro West partnership communities when she gets all of Northborough in addition to Bolton, Berlin. So we thank her for her active participation in the Metro West uh, delegation. With that, I wanna thank everybody for participating today. We're a bit over time, we're gonna wrap. Uh, we will tease uh, our next topic for the Transportation Committee a little bit later in the fall. I'm sure uh, those of you, most of you have followed the news that uh, the Commonwealth uh, has settled on an all at grade option for the I-90 Alston multimodal. We will be joined by MassDOT for a presentation focused specifically on I-90 Alston multimodal, which is of course of uh, substantial significance to, to folks who commute uh, and do business to points west of the city. So we're looking forward to that. Watch for details, go to 495partnership.org and join our email list if you're not already there. So with that, on behalf of the 495 Metro West Partnership, I wanna thank Rob, Joe, our staff and all of our presenters this morning, and we will see you all soon. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody.